And it is my great pleasure and uh, tremendous um, thrill to welcome Trisha Brown. This has been uh, an eight-year hiatus, and we are so uh, pleased to have you back in the Twin Cities, especially with such a major new piece. There's no way we're going to have the chance to talk about your full career, um, but um, we're going to hit on some high points, we hope. And really, this is a chance for you all to be able to ask questions as well. We do have um, a range of video that we, we make you up. Uh, certainly, we're going to see a little excerpt of um, the trilogy work, but um, I'd really like to start with the newest pieces and really mm -hmm. talking a little bit about um, how the trilogy came about and, and mm -hmm. where you kind of went from perhaps your last cycle of works, which were really set to, to, to major classical pieces, right. um, and you found yourself um, dealing with the American art form of jazz. Um, it was a commission uh -huh. from American Dance Festival in celebration of the millennium um, to indigenous American art forms, jazz, and modern dance. I was in the middle of the dance version of Monteverdi's L'Orfeo, having completed the opera, and so it was pretty much like up to here <laughs> in uh, the uh, 1600 early 1600s, <laughs> and they made a proposal to me that I join this uh, grant. Uh, and I said something like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> well, what were your impressions? You know, I mean, obviously, this is a big question, but you know, the thought of creating something to jazz, had you been a fan of that, of that style of music? Of, what, you know, it's obviously such a diverse form. Yeah. Um, you could have found yourself working with a whole range of different you know, types of right. music under the rubric of jazz. But. I know. Um, I, my set designer, Terry Winters, right. um, has followed the downtown jazz scene, and he was the one who recommended to me that oh. I work with Dave. Oh. And he gave me a CD or, I don't know, maybe, anyway, got a CD, and I listened to it. It was The Charms of the Night Sky, right. uh, who will be here. Sunday, in fact, on this stage. So. These musicians play so fantastic. Fantastically, <laughs> you, you don't even have to watch the dance. <laughs> and um, so, um, also, Dave has done a lot of, of um, rearrangements of other right. musicians in the jazz field, um, but also um, Webern and Stravinsky. And I felt a, a kinship with right. that range because right. I had just done. Um, a classical music, and I wanted to balance that out with, I was thinking of Schoenberg. Sure. Right. And, and so that worked out extremely well. Uh, this music is very wide ranging. Yeah. I mean, it's. Um, the music that Dave created the for the that work. That Dave wrote for me, um, for us. It is, in fact, all together, part one, uh, five part weather invention, is five songs. I'm going to call them songs. And then. Um, Rapture to Leon James, the second section, is 14 sections, but some of them are quite small. Nevertheless, they are musical ideas mm -hmm. and other in, you know, changing instruments. And um, Groove and Counter Move is uh, another five uh, songs. And then there are two interludes in this trilogy. Choreography, Don't Bring in the Curtain. Dancers exit, audience applause as it goes quiet. Workmen come out and change, do the changeover in full view. Then uh, somewhere in there, amidst the working ethic here, right. <laughs> comes a soloist huh. doing um, an emotional and very fierce, which, which, which rises to a very fierce level of dancing. I made it on Diane Madden, and it will be performed by Mariah Maloney here. Um, and then we, it just segues into light and um, the, be the beginning of the second piece. Uh, and then again, there's an interlude, which is um, uh, references my background of equipment pieces, um, my sheer love of 
of uh, task in movement, uh, which goes back to Anna Halpern, as you mentioned. Sure. And, um, uh, oh, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing jazz can do for you, you know, right. when you've been <laughs> counting your measures, <laughs> counting your measures and getting your, your mirror reversals just right. <laughs> you know, isn't that a huge shift to, um, I mean, the sense of improvisation, obviously Dave works within a structured improvisational form, but so many choreographers have talked with me about how hard it is when they come the next night and it's different than it yeah. was the night before. Yeah. <laughs> is that, was that challenging? That happened to Dave and me day one of performance. I, I, in uh, the first section there is a, uh, a duet which he titled Scherzo, uh, has a little Baroque beginning, da 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 and then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> and I had a, everything that I made went beautifully with it because it was just, the music is just so cacophonish that right. it was more like a, you know, like a imported carpet or something. Right. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I worked with it for like two weeks, just trying, I wanted, there is a side of me that's quite serious and another side that wanted to play with all of this. And right. I really wanted to try on this short. And so I finally cracked the code. Huh. And I found a way in between their coughs and pushing chairs around and sounds like bleeping and like trying to start the car and it won't go and all this kind of stuff. Every once in a while there would be a chink of silence. Tush, I get the move in. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so that's choreographed. But we were doing it for a gala for Harvey Lichtenstein. And right. I was performing it. Um, and we, we were rehearsing. And I said, Dave, you changed the music. <laughs> <laughs> and I just was crestfallen and terrified. And he said, well, it's improvised. It's scored, you see, but it's improvised. Right. And that's, I, got, I didn't realize that. And so he said, and he could see I was apoplectic, and so he said, uh, Let's put on what tape. do you need? <laughs> <laughs> Did you bring your tape? Right. No, he said, what do you need? He's a great problem solver. Yeah. This is a dear thing about this man huh. for a choreographer. And <laughs> there are dancers in the audience. <laughs> and uh, uh, I said, well, uh, if you could just go, if you could just give me a sound, like a sound every, it's a thir it was a 35 second me uh, section that went bluey. And so I said, okay, every se seven seconds, give me a sound and I'll and teach it to me right now. Huh. So it was Guy on the accordion sure. going, whoa. I want you to listen <laughs> for it when you see this piece. And, it's um, still there. I knew what I was supposed to be doing when I heard that. Huh. If I didn't make it, I adjusted. Right. I slowed down and I sped up. And anyway, I got through it, huh. and uh, so that sound is still in, and that was, that was a real on-the-spot repair job on a colossal problem. Huh. I was there that night. It didn't. You couldn't tell. Uh, it looked Were like you? it came off perfectly. But, uh, yeah. And so you continued to. Would you find that Dave would write music or adapt music, and then you would take to it, or would you work together in the creation of, going back and forth in the creation of? You know, there's so much, did I add up how many songs there are in this? Right. <laughs> it's like 25 or something. <laughs> and it wasn't conceived as a, as a, as a no, trilogy No, it's a at trilogy. All, it grew like Topsy. Right. So I, um, like I was showing him stuff. He's never, he's not been on the big stage and neither has Terry Winters. So I was in a, in a mode of like being very open and trying to get people grounded. And um, I was showing him, I was making aerial, maneuvers as vocabulary, because I usually do that. I build a lot of inventory, right. vocabulary, yeah. and then I mix the last couple of weeks right. uh, everything into formal organization. And there's a lot of editing and sh sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And things don't get in and things, right. yeah. But um, uh, I was showing him my aerial maneuvers, which is only a minute long because it was like five aerial events, and so they were going to be used somewhere in the piece, you know, one here and one over there, and one, when I needed a little spice or something. <laughs> and uh, he came in with music, with mu he'd written it, and it is scored. It, I don't believe it's improvised. Right. I mean, they do play around a little right. maybe, but, and he built beautiful, he made aerial music. Huh. Um, 
and I was in the rehearsal when he was building it up with the musicians, and it's exquisite. Hmm. And there I was stuck with a one-minute appetizer at the beginning of <laughs> five, <laughs> five weather. Uh, that and... How is the title chosen for the first five section? Five-part weather yeah. invention. Well, dancers name their phrases. We right. have internal names for everything, and they're kind of wonderful. Um, uh, we all, do, you know, someone pitches, we all pitch names in. And I had given, I like the idea of a machine that creates dancing. And I was looking for a rhythmic pattern, this is because it was before Dave's music. And I figured if I make, make a rhythmic pattern, it will work huh. uh, somehow. And um, so I had a large, lush phrase that I took, I stole from an earlier choreography. And I had two, uh, two people actually, I had two couples doing this at the same time. And I t instructed them, large, lush, phrase billow out there and the their partners were to get in as close as they could don't get hit like weather getting as close as you can get like weather huh. like huh. touching really right. but not not interfering with anything and so you there is a phrase in which there's a fast asymm asymmetrical foot pattern because it has not come from a human mind <laughs> and uh and a lot of bucking back and things like that, and no arms. Like an arm will go up for protection here and there. Right. Huh. So that's the weather phrase, and there are two huh. of them, A and B. And how it plays out in the choreography is if you see the lush phrase, which you don't see until later, you see the weather phrase first, and you see the weather phrase with, in, with um, improvised arms by a leader in a section, uh, it's, it's, it's effect without the cause. Hmm. And those things are wonderful. Huh. And then when the B phrase comes back, it comes on a phrase, it comes not with its mother phrase, you know, not with the phrase that it came out of, but with something completely different. Right. So it's a different, it's a different kind of uh, space dodge, space hmm. thing that happens. There's a section of the work um, that you've called, of the first section, um, the eel. Uh, the eel. Where maybe, we have a, a brief video excerpt that maybe we could show, but do you want to talk a little bit about, before we look at it, um, how you developed that section, where it comes in the piece? Uh, it comes early in five-part weather, uh, after um, Kathleen's improvisation. And I just want to tell you now, because I may forget, we, Kathleen's improvisation was two minutes long. It's in the first aria of Dave's music. And um, we videotaped it, all of the performances. And then when we got to the last choreography, in, the third choreography, we culled out of those uh, videotapes traveling phrases of high energy mm. and, and articulation. And um, all the dancers learned them. And so then that comes back in. That is the very last section of the trilogy. Hmm. It's a, you know, Dave builds up a Cecil B. DeMille crescendo. Right. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> And that's the material we're using. That's a concept I like a lot, to take, to go back into the thematic material, and take out of that, take it out in a new direction, so that uh, you don't really recognize it, but it's, has a kinship and a coherence overall. And the eel section um, will, okay. do you see that in other parts of the Yes, work you do. Well? The eel yeah. comes out, it backs into the space. It's the, it's a weather phrase in the, leg, in the legs, but it's in a canon of about mm, a move apart of nine people. Mm. So what happens is since the head of the eel, which is downstage, is moving out this way, and things are following. She cuts back, and things are still coming around this way. So you get a line like this. That's how it got its name. And um, I loved it because the head goes into counterpoint with the tail. Hmm. And that just made, you know, that again is a kind of um, very uh, economic recycling of thematic material. 
I even got counterpoint out of it. <laughs> then there's a second time it appears and it embellishes, and I, I threw in some aerial maneuvers. Uh -huh. And then the third time it comes in, and I'll tell you this and then I will stop talking about it, uh, it comes in in a U shape. You'll recognize this piece. The, the stage goes to um, silhouette. And the dancers had had their head like this and coming up like that, but now it's two heads, one far downstage, one as far as they can be upstage. Here, I'll put it this way vertically. And then two, 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 and we're nine, so then there's a ninth person. So what you'll see, to read across to the upstage, this is a fun part of looking at patterns in choreography. Out goes these two. You might miss them, but you'll get these two if you do. Then you know where to look here. And then four, and it all comes out like kind of like that. The ninth person at far, far end, and then it, there's a, it 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 continues. It gets into a big tangle, etc. And then it does its final, goes back and forth a few times, and it does its big exit. Its exit. Hmm. Let's let's take a look, and we'll yeah. see, we'll see. Should we pull this sure. aside?
great to see. It's, uh, it feels a little odd that we're going to get to see the, the real thing in two nights, but it's so nice to yeah. hear, have the chance to have you talk a little bit about the mm -hmm. construction of the movement. Mm -hmm. You've talked uh, in the past, I mean, one of the things that's always marked your work is this wonderful organic sort of fluidity that in, your, in your dancers. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, my sense is it seems it comes from you. Um, how do you convey the that kind of movement style that you've always had to, um, mm -hmm. onto, your, onto your dancers? How do you, do you look for people who have that capability and, mm -hmm. or do you spend, must spend months if not mm -hmm. years with, with people to, mm -hmm. you know, to get that, um, mm -hmm. that essence? You know, actually there are two people in this audience, I believe, who helped me figure out how to take my sequential, slippery isolation of moves, mm -hmm. kind of, things which I believe they called them schnurkels. <laughs> Judith and Elizabeth, are you here? I'm here. I'm yeah, there's <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth Garen and Judith were here. We're in my company in the middle 70s. And um, I was, um, uh, it's naturally how I move. Right. And that's very difficult to pass on to someone else. It's like saying, OK, sneeze like I do. Right. And um, it's just not possible. And, and, it, and uh, I, I had a feel these are very uh, astute dancers. Was, in truth, I didn't really know how I danced huh. because I used improvisation so much, I kind of pushed that, kind, that cognition, of, that capturing of what you're doing, I kind of pushed it aside so I could do be it. a free spirit. Right. Yeah, do it. <laughs> and, um, uh, I, I, my, my image of them was that they were like jewelers with a jewel table, <laughs> with a work table, <laughs> and that they had little, little, little tiny hammers, and they were, they were making you know, these little facets and things because they could see that there's a lot of splash off of my movement. And so there's like kind of, you don't want to, they, they had a regard for it fortunately for me, and that it, um, uh, even though I thought you could come up with something better than schnurkel, I think splash <laughs> than schnurkel. But we get the broad strokes and the after, after images. And um, it built up from that over time. Uh, well, we're... <coughs> Thank you, guys, for helping do <laughs> Minneapolis the, power. <laughs> the other thing that you've been quoted as saying is that you really look for dancers who have an appetite for moving off center. Can you, I mean, you see, I think one can see in the excerpt we saw, too, yeah. your interest in, throw, uh -huh. in that, that um, throwing uh, uh, curves um, to the dancers to have yeah. them yeah. sort of um, that surprise of being off yeah. center. Yeah. Could you describe, explain that a little bit? Well, it, it's basically, it's like being willing to dance off center. It means that you have a, a degree of comfort doing that. Mm. And again, it probably just comes naturally, like, or unless you skied a lot or something that banked, if you understood movement that banked. Right. Um, and uh, to look like you're not falling, even though you were right on the edge of falling. Right. That was a, that was, um, very much in my vocabulary earlier on. It, right. it, it, it continues, but um, uh, other things have joined in. So right. Other vocabulary has joined in since then, so it's not, it's not front and so center. Yeah. Yeah. We saw Terry Winter's beautiful set um, in the mm -hmm. background, and um, it sounded like you started with Terry as a collaborator on this piece. How, do you, how, how did you work together, and, and how mm -hmm. did you, what kind of instruction did you pass along or inspiration did you give him um, mm -hmm. in the creation of the visual look of the work? Well, Terry is one of these just um, out of a canon, improvising abstractionist in painting. And um, uh, he's so talented, he can barely keep up with himself. <laughs> uh, and I've known his work for a long time and he's a friend. That is, that is a prerequisite in my collaborations, is that they be a friend, or I believe I could be friend, a friend of them. Mm -hmm. I don't like um, people who are antagonistic. Um, although I've been in my share of antagonistic <laughs> collaborations, it just seems to come up. <laughs> and, um, uh, 
does it do people stay friends uh, generally yeah, through the yeah club, yeah it? except for one I lost one. <laughs> yeah, it was really a good collaboration because I had to fight for my life hmm. so I appreciated it in the end very much let us go where we were where with we, Terry and Terry uh, yeah Did I I felt a kinship to his painting the first time I saw it because was, they were they were structures like architectural structures, but, or again, jewels or crystals or things like that, and I love structure, so, and he was working in black and white at that time. Okay, so I go to his, it's funny, both Dave and Terry. Dave Douglas, the composer. Yeah. yeah. Either they got together, or separately on their own, they said, is there a story in this? <laughs> <laughs> and so, duh. So, with Ter Terry was showing me a series of these woodcuts he does on the computer, which is really an oxymoron in my estimation. I have <laughs> right, no idea right. how he does it, but that's what that's what uh -huh. these are. And um, uh, what does that mean? It, he, I don't know. He, he, he I'll write you a letter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a seminar. Right. Tells right. all. Well, <laughs> Philip Byron Terry tells out, all. And he can yeah, explain you it do. Yeah. Uh, he he was showing me. Uh, it is a proliferation of paintings and work, just like Dave and his music. So he's showing me these pieces very quickly, da da da, da da da. And I stopped at one point and I said, This one, you only have your black lines um, ricocheting all over the place on one side of the page. If that was up on the wall, Terry, I would probably only do my dancing over on the floor on this side. Hmm. So it would make some kind of a diagonal between the pictorial space and the uh, foreground. And he said, God, that helps. That mm. helps me. <laughs> so, uh, we just went on from there. <laughs> Jennifer Tipton brought a lot to this project. And Jennifer Tipton was the lighting designer yeah. for this work. Uh, she's she's uh, t truly one of the geniuses. And um, uh, Terry gave her paint chips for the colors in Rapture, hmm. for the background. And... Um, of course, Jennifer knows that the paint chips are opaque and she's supposed to make it out of light. Huh, right. So she was deeply challenged by this and I guess people won't challenge her too much. She was really excited. Huh. And she made, she made those colors. Huh. But she was not only lighting the background, she was lighting the air we were dancing in. And that's just an interesting thought, isn't it? Hmm. Like one point she said, the air is yellow now. I just thought, oh, it huh. it's so beautiful. Huh. <laughs> But it worked with the costumes and, and the lighting and the black and whiteness, and then when the second part goes into color, it all kind of, we did a, we hit a great unity. Huh. There was a um, chapter that you recently wrote in the Robert Rauschenberg um, retrospective uh, catalog that was entitled Collaboration, Life and Death in the Aesthetic Zone. Um, it, it was, uh, did that relate to, um, uh, were you in reference to the process of collaboration? It seems like you've had a really, a sort of ease of a collaborative spirit in your work. Um, I'm also curious, is your work as a visual artist yourself in your drawing um, help you communicate with visual art collaborators um, in a way that perhaps other choreographers may not have the same vocabulary or the same understanding of the form? Well, that certainly is a part of how I arrive at a friendship with uh -huh. some uh, with painters and all, um, and that that happened in the early '60s because there were very few of us, and there were some painters, some composers, and some dancers, and we right. all got to know each other. A lot of it circulated around the Cunningham Cage um, axis, the axis <laughs> dynamic, right. and um, uh, I mean I've. Also, I had a position in the art world because the work that I was doing walking down the sides of buildings, that really made an inroad on sculpture. Hmm. It was pre-performance art, et cetera, but it was, um, they were beautiful pieces. They were spectacular, but they were, they were ordinary. And right. it was a wonderful cut that I got, you know, line I got between right. the two. So I think in that way, um, and in those early works, many of the people who came out to see them and, and appreciated them were, were from the visual art world. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. At Judson, too. Yeah, uh -huh. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, I used... 
But I think, you know, like Bob, I did six pieces with Bob right. Rauschenberg. He made this for me. <laughs> I got a phone call on the stage in Lucerne. Trisha, <laughs> <laughs> I have a, 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 a jewel for you. <laughs> it's a safety pin with a whole bunch of trinkets on it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's how he, that's, that's, that tells you something about the personality. Right. Yeah. Uh, one key to my early collaborators is that they were all sculptors. Mm. Um, Terry is not a sculptor, but he made a set piece. Uh -huh. So I'll bring him along somehow. Right. Right. <laughs> but I thought that sculptors would understand volume and bodies and, and space. space very well. Mm. It, what it led to is that they got into my space. And um, that's, where, that's where the <laughs> love and death come in. <laughs> so the, um, after, after the first section that you developed, um, and you received a second commission to create Rapture, um, tell me about Leon James. Is that, uh, who, um, maybe we could just uh, talk about that title and, and what that, right. where some of those reference points come from. Well, I got in the habit of, of doing research in, uh, when I was working in music and uh, certainly in the operas and um, studying everything all around, it, you know, like the parents of the artists and the next generation of the artists. So I tried to get a span of ambiance, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I may. <laughs> and um, so I, went, I wanted to do, I wanted to honor um, uh, Jazz. Right. So I went. I, I I did research on the Savoy Ballroom, and which takes you back. I mean, certainly African American. It takes you back to Africa eventually. Right. And um, so I saw a lot of black and white footage from the Cat's Corner in the Savoy mm. Ballroom. Huh. And um, I mean, just the most. The Cat's Corner was a section of. The that's Savoy where the there. kings of dancing huh. were, huh. with their partners. I wondered, why are they always shooting just these 20 people? I know that the Savoy Ballroom is a block long. Right. Why don't they spin the camera around? <laughs> this is it. This huh. is the creme de la creme. And you didn't tread there unless you knew what you, you were You couldn't doing. get in there. Uh -huh. I mean, no one dared it. I think uh -huh. at some point there was a hullabaloo because a very good young dancer did crash it. But huh. anyway, I don't know the details. I, I loved all this stuff. I loved... Master Juba, huh, he's right. 27. Huh. His name is uh, something Lane, and he danced. He danced downtown in the 1800s, late 1800s. Irish jig, black, right. coming up from the south. Quite an amazing. Uh, well, I guess they made tap dance, and it was right. really an amazing period. Yeah. And um, uh, and, and, and he danced, Master Juba danced once in the Barnum and Bailey Museum, huh. Circus Museum. Huh. And that's my building on Broadway. Oh, really? Wow. Huh. I used to think maybe I was a freak or something. This is how this karma came about. But I know now it was something else. <laughs> but, um, so African line dances, people calling out. That line dance goes into the Madison. Someone may know from the 60s. They called it the Madison. Circle dances, cakewalk, right. um, all, all of those um, I access. And Leon, when he dances on a film, is, he's just, his face is just filled with joy. Hmm. It is so, his face looks like how I feel when I dance my best. Huh. So I was very drawn to him, but there were others that were fantastic dancers also. In that second section, it seems you make some spe even specific references to styles of dance at that time. Yeah. Gently, you, you refer to them just kind of in passing almost, right. but Lindy yeah. Hop and other styles of, uh, of, of movement yeah. at that time. Um, was that uh, well, unconscious? Well, Lindy or, a little, a little Jitterbug bit? a little. Right. Um, I had a very big job on Rapture. Dave, I think Dave was a little bit like he's a modern jazz musician. Right. I felt like swing was just a little. I don't know why I say that though. Maybe, he, maybe not as much part of his universe so much. Uh, right, yeah. chosen universe. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I just want you to know he made a form. I've worked on this structure before, but I thought of it as a tree, like there's a. Uh, 
a like, cross-section of a tree, concentric circles, A, B, C, D. <laughs> and D is the core of the tree. But Dave goes one, two, zero. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven is the Savoy Ballroom. Six, he actually dismissed five over here because it was so raucous. He puts it in over here. It's called disjunct. Huh. And it will drive you out of the theater. <laughs> but stay. <laughs> the dancing is beautiful. <laughs> four, three, two, one. He truncates this side. That's hard structure. I accepted it because I knew I was now going to have three pieces, and it was the center. And the center of his pyramid was going to be at the center of this piece. And it just somehow seemed huh. possible. Hmm. But I had other things I was working on. I right. improvised a lot of that movement on my own body. And I made 60 short phrases, and I got better huh. as I went along until I was just like, we see my body moves like an African-American body. I isolate gestures, I undulate my back, I move right. sequentially. Right. I lead out with different parts, pelvis, huh. African-American, but other parts. And, um, and I, just, I just took the license huh. to go into the kind of movement I did in high school. Right. Huh. But I had this control tower on my shoulders. It was going, huh. wah, 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 wah. <laughs> uh, and uh, huh. it was really interesting. A, a modernist control tower? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Huh. Was there joyousness to kind of? Oh, get, yeah. yeah. In the beginning, I in the beginning I was just trying. You know, right. you have to start somewhere. But by the end, oh, and he he went to Banff for two weeks or four weeks or whatever, and he was going to write the music, and he didn't get the music written because he. Couldn't. So I was working on a, uh, a percussion score of his mm. that, you know, that had no narrative melody right. to it of any kind. It just yeah. has the sounds of the percussion and the, the, um, the grid, uh -huh. grid of sound. Right. And uh, so I think that was where I did the best work. And um, so then we took we took thirty of those, and we taught it to everyone in the company. Mm. And so that shows up in part two. And um, uh, someone's leaving. It always makes me feel so bad. <laughs> you see that? I've been doing this for 50 years now. <laughs> oh, well. They'll come and see the work. Yeah, yeah right. You know, and we do have a video excerpts of, um, of, of this work. I don't know. I'm a little concerned about our time, um, so we maybe shouldn't show it. I, I, I looked at my watch and suddenly it's 8 o'clock. All right, all right. If you, if you promise to all stay and ask some questions after. <laughs> yeah, don't walk out. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to show about four minutes of it so you can see a little bit of the section. In fact, it starts with a fairly free, improvised section by the musicians, it sounds like. So yeah. you, this, you'll have to tell us about this afterwards. <laughs>
so then um, Groove and, and uh, Count. Count Groove. Yeah, Count Groove. Yeah. Um, in some ways, you, you, it was a summation of the first two mm -hmm. movements, yes. as well as a right. rearticulation and a kind of mm -hmm. um, enhancement of it. Um, mm -hmm. How did you come, come about um, in, to create the final section? Well, I had um, the very first section, which is just delicious movement on two women to a beautiful piece of music. I had been asking from that, for that from day one, sort right. of like old-fashioned jazz. And, and um, Dave came up with it at the um, premiere of part two. He said, <laughs> <laughs> during the rehearsal, he said, I want you to hear something. And they played it, and that was beautiful. Huh. So that's new material that had been passed along the line, didn't find a place in the first two pieces. Right. And um, did he sense you were you were hoping for something that he that he he was resisting um, providing up until that point? Yeah, he was trying, I think. Right. But yeah. it just didn't come. Uh, but then it, that's a funny thing. Like he said, I just wrote it in my head last night in the hotel room. <laughs> it's kind of wonderful to work with a composer who is that. Uh, uh, prolific or right. yeah, yeah, prodigious, yeah. He has, Dave Douglas has, I think, seven or not eight or nine ensemble, different ensembles that yes, are operating at any I given know. time. Yes, he does. I know. Always, always sprouting a new one yeah. also. You, you had said that he choreographs the mus musicians. Uh -huh. um, yeah. How, 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 did, how did you mean? Well, he, he put the charms of the night sky right. are in part one, and that's, um, that's a Dave trumpet, Greg Cohen on double bass, Guy Klusevic on accordion, and a Mark Feldman on violin. And that's, that's the first quartet you hear. They play together a lot. For, for the transition in and out of the pit uh, of the interlude, you know, everything's changing over on stage. He changes over the musicians, and he introduces percussion, which is Susie Ibarra. And she has beautiful instruments, as you know. Who did a wonderful evening here last year, just to her did own she? music. Did yeah. she? Did she? Yeah. I have a couple of her CDs. Yeah, she's yeah. great. Uh, and so then she's it. She is introduced to the next group, to the next uh, um, um, Mark and um, Guy go out. And in comes Greg Tardy, and, who plays um, tenor sax and clarinet. And uh, third, mu third musician comes in as well. Yeah. Uh, maybe Greg. Huh? I want to get this right, so. So I've already described the first quartet and the percussion. And then the trumpet and the bass stay, and the tenor sax and the percussion come in. And then, um, and then everyone is together in part three. And uh, there's a violin for the interlude. Hmm. And, um, the interlude between the second and Between two parts. and three. Yeah. yeah. At one point, you'd said, the f the, I believe, the end of the final section you felt like it was allowing um, the, the, the opening of the gates to letting the racehorses out um, in terms of your company. Is that yeah. the freedom of movement that, or the sheer exuberance of the movement vocabulary that you allowed at that point? Or, uh... You know, when we did the uh, L'Orfeo, I, in order to win those awards on that opera, I had to, I, I had to do a lot of work on my dancers. And um, they became teachers to the singers. They grounded the singers, and the mm. singers really took, act, took, took action on the stage. It was quite, mm. quite a beautiful thing to see. But my dancers uh, didn't get to get their yah yas out one right. single time. <laughs> <laughs> and they were just like always like, you know, shepherding a singer. <laughs> and, uh, and so I heard it for like a year. Huh. I want to dance. I want to dance. <laughs> so, I thought, so you were referring to this whole the so, whole trilogy, really. yeah. yeah. So that I just was ready to, you uh, know, I was ready to move out too into movement. Right. Yeah. No, I was speaking of your fail first in that whole process. Right. But you've enjoyed your work in the opera as well. It seems I've adored like you've had it. Great. I've success. adored it. Uh. <laughs> 
seems like a vastly different proposition to direct um, an opera than it is to create a, uh, an evening of dance. Or, it is. Yeah. I mean, there's there are all the things I eschewed as a young right. thing. <laughs> <laughs> Those things we resist reminding you, coming back to. <laughs> right. right. We're coming full circle here with character, psychology, virtuosity. emotion, <laughs> virtuosity, and narrative. <laughs> <laughs> Never say never. <laughs> <laughs> and ain't over till it's over. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, you know, I do really want to make sure that we have a chance for your questions. I have a lot more of my own questions, so if we run out of any of yours, I'll pop in with mine. But maybe we could bring the house lights up a little bit mm -hmm. and nice. see um, who, would, who, ha who would like to ask anything. And it's always, I'm always um, admire that first person that gets up their hand. So. Yes, way up on the top. Cycle. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Okay. Is that a hard one? <laughs> <laughs> I go so far deep into every piece I make. I barely make it back out. I always cry <laughs> the dress rehearsal. I, mean, I really get very deeply engaged. So um, there are some special pieces along the way, but not one single no. one. Yeah. No. Other questions? Yes. In the trilogy, or, or in general, in maybe general? maybe you might want to, in a thumbnail, uh, talk about your re relationship to music um, historically. I, I realize that's a long uh, description. <laughs> As if that's long. <laughs> um, well, while I, while I was identifying what my movement vocabulary was, um, I was also working in silence because I didn't want music to marshal me along in any any direction. And I suppose I had something of an artist temperament. I remember saying to people, well, you don't have to listen to music when you look at sculpture, do you? I mean, I've sort of, I, but I also had, a, I, I had a, <laughs> an ear for the sounds in the environment, the stage, my dancers. Why are you laughing? <laughs> what did I? The, um, uh, breath and footfall and those things. And um, I moved away from it when I went on to the proscenium stage because people were coughing so much in the audience and it really, really upset me. <laughs> and uh, no, they, I understood. They knew that there was going to be dance and music because it's a dance concert and they came in and there wasn't any. So there's this little record going all the time. Where's the music? Where's the music? Where's the music? And they couldn't look. So I thought I should, I should help these people to look, to see, to feel. And so I put music with my work. And uh, I started with Bob Ashley, then I went to Laurie Anderson. So I started the downtown spirit of making things. When I knew I wanted to make an op direct an opera, big difference between choreographing an opera and directing an opera, I had to make myself and my dancers accountable for a score, measure for measure, note for note. Right. And so we started with Bach, hmm. uh, Anton Webern, and uh, Monteverdi. So, and you threw yourself into deep study of, of, those, of the structures of those compositions. I did. Yeah. Well, I'm very interested in structure, and it's right there in the music. And right. I, you know, and it's, it's, um, it's a conversation you can have. Hmm. And that's the first way I worked with the music, was to find in Bach's structures. So, Parallel structures that could hover, hmm. or could could exist in the same, in a proximity to him, and um, uh, and in some cases, and, and actually, I was quite quite diligent in being exactly on the first fugue, hmm. Rishikar, and some of the canons, and. Um, Yes, to, yes, on the trio sonata. Oh no, I was a I was I was a little antagonistic in some of the sections of it. Um, 
Well, you know, to get some grit so that so there would be some, some dialogue there. Right. And, and, and to have my own identity. Uh, but then on um, the six-part fugue, I'm talking too much. Let, let us go. Yeah, well, Let's jump forward. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes. Sure. Were there any times that you would present some phrases and have Dave surprise you with what that sounded like? Huh. No, but you know, they're live. <laughs> he doesn't play the same every night. They don't play the same. And the dancers don't dance the same. So there is that kind of what you're asking about. Hmm. So it could surprise you any given night as to how, how they kind of relate in a, yeah. in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. The dancers are either improvising or fixed choreography or a combination of the two. Like the section you, you actually saw where Keith was, came out to signal the arms. That was an early tape because it's much more elaborate ar armage now. Right. But that's the lower body is doing one thing and he's inventing arms is doing something else. And mm. it gives a feathering effect and that's something I like. Right. Who else has any questions? Yes? I'm curious when, when you took your dance away from all kinds of spaces and after spaces and then you went back to what you said the proceeding stage, what, what was that decision process like? Why did you decide to go back? What were you looking for? Why did I leave the alternative space and go back to the proscenium theater? Go back to or it. Or maybe not go, go into it. Yeah, yeah. go into it. Um, my son was growing up, and he wanted to go to college, and I had to get into the circuit of touring. And um, it wasn't working, you know. If you're walking down the side of a building, it's, you're not walking down any building, you know. It has, there's a, f a form there, <laughs> believe it or not. Hmm. Have you found yourself enjoying um, uh, the stage, the the fr the frame of the stage, the the mm -hmm. the structure of of that of that theatrical space. I love it. Yeah, yeah. At first, I was cranky, but right, <laughs> <laughs> I found my way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So the work of the Judson was political in that way, but how do you see this as like after all? The What was just the last half set? What is, what is the after effect of this work, mm -hmm. of my work? Yeah, like the work of the Judson had a political place, had a statement, so to speak. Mm -hmm. How do you see that as changing now that it's on stage? Well, it's in, it's in advancing the form. Um, People in France say that no one can go back now in making operas without the dancers, without the singers moving. It's a benchmark in the history of opera. They don't say wonderful things like that in America, but <laughs> they, do, they do there. And um, uh, that changed something. For, uh, that's a rebellious act. That's a very well done rebellious act. It's one that matters. And um, when you were working um, with the Jetson Dance Theater artists, did you did you feel that you were out to change the world and impact um, outside the field of of the arts, or has some of that been applied to the movement in historical hindsight, um, in terms of mm -hmm. its? Yeah. You know, revolutionary impact. Yeah. Well, I was 23, and um, <laughs> um, I just took the first five years of Judson as a period of experimentation and discovery, mm -hmm. and how it resonated through through the rest of, you know, through the audiences and beyond. I really didn't have an idea how that was. Right. 
did you see it as part of the zeitgeist of what was happening in the 60s with the civil rights movement, with social upheaval in general, and, and um, the, the spirit of experimentation, obviously. And questioning uh -huh. the given. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yes, um, one, way up in the corner, and then we'll come over to you. Uh, I, I could talk about funding. <laughs> <laughs> Dale could talk about funding. Right. Um, I, I don't think I can summarize that for you. It's a topic. I, I, I will say one thing about it that I think is useful instead of just hearing my, my, life, my experience. And that is, until I got involved in the business aspect of my company, it, I things did not really work. You can have excellent choreography and no business and you won't make the long range. And you can have excellent business in PR and so-so choreography and you will have a short-term life, but it will not make the long range. I think you need to have both. Hmm. Um, there's this notion, someone's going to come in and help me. I, they haven't come yet, <laughs> so I mean, it really has to come. I think an institution may be different, but if you're an independent artist, choreographer, it has to come from that person. Is it hard now to resent the side time that you need to devote to the business side of um, your work? I am fighting for my artistic life. Hmm. Meaning the time to create or in mm -hmm. a bigger picture? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. There was a question. I was wondering how you go about creating a typical phrase. Do you start improvising on your own body, or do you work a variety of ways? I work a variety of ways. I've built them on my dancers, um, constructed gesture and motion on my dancers, um, and I've uh, improvised my own from my own resources and videotaped it, and they've learned it. Um, I, early on, in my early, when I was trying to discover how is it anyone makes a dance here, <laughs> please, <laughs> uh, I tried vocab, you know, um, writing out instructions, uh, uh, lots of different strategies to get the dancers to make dance that I liked. Other questions? I have, a, I have to ask you about how you're feeling about the, the state. Um, I know it's, it's one of these standard questions, but the state of dance in general and where it's heading, how, what's your experiences of audiences in, in the states, for instance, um, and whether you're generally hopeful uh, for the future of the form and um, its receptivity by, by audiences, especially for innovative work. Well, in truth, I'm a little down um, from 9-11, from the implosion of that, those two architectures, and from the implosion of Enron. I feel like it's a really, a, uh, what is my voice? Right. What effect can I have on any of this? Every, I mean, uh, I, um, we have strong supporters in, in different places in this country, people who believe in the work and love it and bring us back. And, um, uh, but it's, we don't have as much um, booking in the US as we still do in Europe. Um, and that makes me sad, because this, yeah. this is my place. I was offered a centre in uh, Montpellier years ago, and I couldn't, my dancers weren't, weren't ready to do something like that, so I turned it down. Mm. So, um, which I think is good, but. Um, 
I fear for independent uh, choreographers, for, for mid-career choreographers who have always been endangered. Mm. And um, um, did I come close to answering yes, any you of did. that? <laughs> it, it will be, I'm wondering how the, and it may be not, uh, it may be a rhetorical question, but how the tragedies of September 11th and the ongoing after effects will impact creative work uh, by artists uh, now and in the coming couple of years. Um, yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, it's like the best and the worst of times. Right. Creatively, it's there, it's all there. But I know on, on, you know, I was scheduled to be on a stage between the two Twin Towers at 9 a.m. on 9-11. I heard that. Yeah. And so, and I live 15 blocks, 20 blocks from there, so we, we went through the war zone of that. Uptown had a different experience. Right. Um, um, I stayed working. I'm going to keep working. You know, all my life, whenever things have been really bad, I've just gone into, I just say, Trisha, go in the studio and get to work. That's right. been my salvation. It didn't work this time because it's the body that has to go in, and the body just got, the body psyche just got so devastated by that. Right. And so, but I was working on, working on a new thing of drawing. I'm making a museum piece with large pieces of paper and charcoal. And, pastel in my hands and the winterizer is playing on the music and I get wigged out at the edge of this huge piece of paper and I just dive into it and I make a drawing. And they're, they're, they turn out to be good drawings and I love them very much. That all came up in October, so huh. go, go figure, you know. Right. And then, and then, but on the Friday anthrax, I lost it. Huh. I stayed in, I said, okay. My assistant is on her cell phone calling everyone she knows, and I'm in calling the office and say, get, get, send the staff home. And right. I said, we're going to stay here and work. You can just see it in the drawings that they, yeah. the first one is strong, the second one is a little unfocused, and the third one is not worth, you know, you just tear it up right away. And that is my answer. Right. I made a quartet also, which I'd started last April, and it's to music by Salvatore Sherino, who's a very brilliant composer, he did the second opera I did, he wrote that. Right. And the music is, uh, the title is Geometry of Crying, because that's in the music. We were talking one day, and I said, I hear the structure, but emotion is coming in, and I said, it's like this geometry, and he said, and then there's the crying. So that's how I got its title. It's, um, it goes right on into emotion. I was thinking of sculpture, of double sculptures, two bodies, of one body emerging from the other body. Uh, um, just kind of amazing partnering, coupling. Mm. And, um, and primal, something primal about it. Mm. Uh, and I pushed it, once I saw that, that, I had the template for how to go forward, so I, I, I push for the, for the awe, the strangeness in things. Mm. And um, it's a tender choreography, and I feel very tenderly towards it. And so that's maybe, I mean, that's the best I can tell you about my experience in making art through this. I think uh, amongst my peers and pals in New York, there is a kind of a emotional flatness. It's not all the time. Right. People, you forget. I mean, you know, you have fun, but right. but also there's something different. There's a different right. uh, beingness. I opened the book um, yesterday of the uh, about your work. The drawings came out from France, and there's the full page double spread picture of um, group primary accumulation, which was a work that you did in Loring Park here in 1974, and above you, rising above. This is a piece that takes place in, uh, in water, sometimes in boats and in rafts, and, uh, um, and the Twin Towers were, were, we were doing it right in front of the World yes. Trade Towers. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. This is in 1973 yeah. or four. Mm -hmm. We have time for one last question, if anyone um, still has one. Uh, yes.
Is it about what? The well, I'm definitely exotic in France because I'm American, and um, they like structure, and they like abstraction. They have a longer history with art. Um, I mean, they're much older, you know, and. Um, um, they grew up with me, but the, the way that they could grow up with me is that they invited me back every mm. other year, every year. Right. And they had me come in and teach and work and lecture. And, and so they, they, they knew me very well. Uh, whereas um, in the U.S., it's more spread out. People, I work in cycles, and I think some people locked onto the earlier cycles and thought, oh, I don't want to see someone on a raft. They don't know that this exists. Um, right. Tactily, they don't know it because they don't bring us in. And I think by the time people did uh, um, find a, an awareness of this work, our prices are high. We're a bigger company, a bigger organization. More staff has to travel with us. So they didn't grow with us, you see. Well, I'm going to finish with one last question. Um, what's giving you the most delight right now in the work that you're doing? Uh, um, or in the things you're looking toward for the future in terms of work or I just started on the Vinterizer with Simon Keenside, who was my orth one of my Orfeos. He's a gr he's a great mover. Huh. There's a moment in the Orfeo. He's a British the, baritone. Uh, he's a yeah he yeah, is yeah. British baritone and but he's a mar marathoner also. It explains it. There's one uh, moment when he's jumping over the head of one of my dancers and he doesn't come down soon enough <laughs> to, to do his aria, so he just starts singing while he's up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> this is not your standard opera singer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm looking forward because the opera system is it's a big industry and they don't really believe in process and development and right. coming again with the same you know growing the the dancers or singer up with you so that you get onto the same uh a communication of language and ideas, a deeper, the deep, you keep going deeper into right. possibilities. Um, they just, they're free agents and they move around and they're like, they're, they slap things together. And right. I mean, I, I will say that the, the, they gave us young singers for the Orfeo. They weren't set in their ways and they weren't divas yet. But they, what they, they told me that no director knows the music. <laughs> you mean I wasted all that? <laughs> <laughs> I spent three years learning. The <laughs> Huh. Yeah. And we would have discussions about the role and things. So it was really very, that was very nice. So I get to work again with Simon and I know his capability. That, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm looking forward to this museum piece because it, yeah. I felt somewhat fragmented. This is confession time. Uh, between um, my visual art, I cannot do all three of them each day, be it meetings at, at the company and warm up, keep myself in shape. It doesn't exist this time, this amount of time in a day. So if I'm working on a choreography, I feel so sorry for my draw ta drawing table. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm overdrawing, I feel so guilty because I'm not working on the music. So I just put them all together. And I think it will be integrating for me. And I think that that's a hint in what's in, in this new quar quartet. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you all for coming and especially thank Trisha Brown for being with us tonight. It's been a pleasure.